the title of the talk is UCLA Cloud Storage is the last time you're going to hear the word cloud. So, um, you know, I don't think I have to say anything more about that. Too. Whoops, hold on. Of course, I, I have a PhD in computer science, but I don't know how to use PowerPoint. So, um, our project grew out of our HPC environment. Uh, we have a, a condo model system that's about 11 or 1,200 nodes at UCLA that's shared between the researchers on campus. So in that regard, we are a little, in one place, a little ahead of San Diego, I guess. Um, over the years, we provide uh, high-performance computing storage, uh, both parallel and sort of scale-out NAS, and we provide that at a particular price, and our researchers are happy with that. But more and more, we were getting people coming with stuff that they wanted to store, you know, more bulk, bulk storage, project storage, things like that. Um, and the cost was too much for storing that kind of long-term data. Actually, I have a different, I updated the presentation. Sorry. Let me, tr let me try this one more time while I'm talking, just because it has that yucky thing at the bottom. Is that better? I'm, I'm, I will. I will try. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about you know, where we came from, what drove us to the particular solution that we came up with, uh, specifically what we're implementing, and some ideas about what the cost, what we expect the cost to look like once we roll it out. Oh, wow, it worked. Uh, as Rita said, I, I, I work for kind of a complicated organization uh, called IDRI, which is the Institute for Digital Research and Education, which in my opinion is an unfortunate name, but uh, that's under the Office of Information Technology. At UCLA, we have kind of a bifurcated uh, IT structure. We have a side that does the administrative computing, and then we have a side that's under the academic computing side. So anything to do with academic computing or research is uh, academic technology services, Office, Office of Information Technology, or, or IDRI, but it's really all the same group of about 40 people uh, that's you know centrally funded. So over the years, we've provided this scale out or parallel storage on our on our clusters. It's we charge five hundred five hundred dollars a terabyte a year. Uh, that includes backup. Uh, that's going to be a challenge going forward. Uh, as I said, many of these users were asking for bulk or archival storage and something that was more affordable. In their case, not quite the free affordable, but something that was cheaper than what they were paying for for the high performance stuff. And you know, we had no real solution to this, no, no practical solution to it anyway. Uh, you, know, you look around and other people could offer us things, vendors could provide us with a solution, other down here or Berkeley or other places, uh, the, the supercomputing centers have solutions for researchers, but they're either too expensive or we couldn't afford them, and it just was or it just wasn't practical. Um, meanwhile, uh, we have all these new people on campus that are generating a lot of data, and you know I like to joke the only department that we don't interface with anymore, I think, is the Portuguese department. Uh, pretty much everyone else has some touches us at some point or some way through either just directly or some center or something that, you know, larger aggregation group on campus. And as Richard said, and I think everyone in the room knows, these people, including the sophisticated users, are storing their data in all kinds of crazy ways. You know, thumb drives, USB drives, you know, something their nephew built for them, on and on and on, right? And, you know, uh, the common theme here, again, and I'm don't want to spend a lot of time on it is that it's cheap and you know even in our case $500 a terabyte a year is just not going to happen not in a million years are they going to pay anything like that just forget it's not a, it's a non-starter um, so what do you do you know nothing well you know as I wrote here doing nothing sounds pretty good actually um, you just put our, put our head back in the sand and just go oh, it's not happening right we have no budget for this we have no mechanism flexible and you know almost everybody in the room works at a university right and those of you unlucky enough to work at one of the big universities things move proportionally slower so anyway um, as I say here doing nothing is sounding pretty good here so but, you know, that bothered us. We like to solve problems. And uh, it got to the point where, for some of us, it got real tiresome to keep saying no to people. Do you have this? Can you help us? You know, no, I, I can't. Yeah, I understand, but no. 
So we were kind of stuck. So we thought, well, maybe we should think about this. You know, what, what could we do if we didn't have any of these constraints, these sort of outside constraints on what we do? And uh, what would it look like given just the realities that the researchers live with, which is, let's face it, primarily a cost-oriented one. And what we did is we came up with a self-contained service, meaning self-funded. Uh, funds itself to cover the cost of the service itself. We don't, we don't infect it, to use a strong word, uh, with any of our other operations. Um, that, the idea is to keep the rates down we also want lo a long-term funding model, which is, I think, a very important point Richard meant, uh, mentioned at the end of his talk. People want three to five year, they want to know that this is going to be around. The sort of one year stuff is really difficult to, you know, get people's attention with. Uh, we wanted to take advantage of our buying power, which, you know, is, some, is an advantage of being at a larger institution. And whatever negotiating skills we have and, and our ability and relationships that we develop with, with, with our vendors, um, you know, to either for volume purchase or, you know, uh, you know expertise or experience or, or comfort with hardware or whatever. Um, we wanted it to be appropriate cost-wise in terms of one of the price below, below what people are paying for the junk they're building now. Basically, what I'd like to tell people is we wanted to offer it at a price. Remember, this is blue sky, right? Offer it at a price that would give people no excuse to not use it. So there are two problems with this. One, will the vendors play ball? And, and I think you could probably follow why I wrote that, which is if I'm going to offer it for basically next to nothing, you know, the vendors are going to have to really uh, you know, swallow it. Uh, it turned out that at least the ones we work with were willing to do this. I mean, I think they clearly saw a long-term play, which is why they agreed to work with us on the price. Now, the bigger question was the university play ball. Well, it, it, in the end, it turned out also yes, but, you know, as we all know, that's a very slow process. Yes doesn't mean, you know, you say yes, yes, we'll do this. They don't say when they'll do it. They just agree that they'll do it, and it turns out that we've actually managed to do this pretty quickly. We came up with this uh, thought experiment about a year ago, le less than a year ago actually, and we're to the point where we're in the final approval stages right now with the campus. So for, for us, that's a really fast process. Um, and I think some of the other things that help with that, one is, is just the budget environment. You know, they want creative ways for people to put services out there that's not gonna cost them money that they're never gonna see again. Um, which is, I think, something that we did here. All right, so we have a storage service. What is it? What does it look like? What are we, what are we doing that's uh, either not repeating what other people did or what are we offering to people? So let's, let's get into that a little bit. Um, we decided also to ask the users. I will say we, did not, we were not as thorough as San Diego has been, so I look forward to looking at the report once they have it done. But I will say, and maybe they'll be heartened, that we pretty much heard almost ex everything that I saw up there. I'm like, okay, I've heard that. That's, that's what I'm hearing. So there's not much difference. I think almost anybody here, if you went out and asked your users, you'd get very similar responses. Um, I kind of joke at being at a novel approach. I mean, a lot of times I think we're all used to kind of, I have this great idea, I'm gonna build something and everyone will come running and knocking my door down to, to use it. And that doesn't, that doesn't work either. And I think it also doesn't work in terms of the funding any longer. Um, as you can see, the biggest request by far was file-based access. Block-based was second. Web-based, and I actually wrote link sharing because that's actually what people wanted. They wanted to be able to share a link to a particular data file with a colleague someplace. was mentioned many, many, many times. Uh, Object-based, virtually no one asked for that. And I think it's even more than the issue of the tools, the end-user tools for object-based storage just don't really exists very well right now. I think there are other reasons that people didn't want that. Several people asked for it as like a third or fourth choice, but more for experimentation or they had some very specific use case. And honestly, for us, we were like, there's a nice service down here in San Diego you can use. You can go to Amazon. There's a zillion people doing that already. So we kind of started backing away from that option. Lots of other people asked for application level stuff, which scared us because we're like, that's not exactly storage, what you're asking for. You know, you're looking for application services. 
And I'll, I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. So, okay, we can do these things, uh, you know, but so what? I mean, the bigger problem was, again, people wanted to do all kinds of things. We, I, I spent a lot of time talking to groups about what are they doing right now and how are they doing it? And there was a big variation in the details, which is also was a little scary. Uh, there's security and policy requirements that I'm sure you all know everyone is ignoring, uh, or not everyone, but mostly everyone. It's a very difficult problem to make people do the right thing. You know, we're getting fined uh, for people releasing, you know, data either intentionally or unintentionally or whatever. I mean, it, this was an issue. And if we're going to start storing this data, we want to be pretty sure we're not complicit in them doing the wrong thing. Uh, so again, we have this sort of A to Z requirements, which is not going to work in terms of an inexpensive process. So this is what we decided to do. We decided to not be everything to everybody. We decided that that wouldn't work cost-wise. We would do it badly, or people would be unhappy. And again, not to duplicate what other people are doing, either on campus or, or at other campuses, or commercially or otherwise. Uh, we made two important choices to try and achieve this. One was we decided to virtualize the front end. There's some technical reasons we decided to do that, and there's some practical reasons uh, in terms of uh, our cost model. And the second was, was to really, I, I kind of coined a term, which is I'm not saying yes and I'm not saying no. In other words, I, I wanted to provide a base for people to do things, uh, but let the, enable them to do what they wanted to do. So the way you do that is to envision a layering kind of model. We're going to provide the very basics to people in a very cost-effective way. And people who want to do collaboration tools, backup tools, syncing tools, on and on and on, all those applications I mentioned, uh, that they would be able to layer those on top of the service and either fire it up as a service on its own, or if they have their own internal funding to do it, whatever, knock yourself out. Uh, then we are not stuck maintaining eight different collaboration tools because we're never going to get, you know, every university is kind of a balkanized distributed thing, but if you really want to see that, you should come to Westwood and you can really see, you know, everybody's doing their own thing there. So, and trying to get everyone to say, yes, we're going to land on one particular courseware system or collaboration system is just, that's not a battle worth fighting. So what we want to do is provide a solid, simple, basic service that people can do things on top of. And you know, how they pay for that, and how, it's, it's kind of the last mile uh, example Richard gave. You know, it's skin in the game, basically, which I think is a good way to put it. Um, the other key aspect of the design is virtualization, and there's really two issues there. One is security and namespace separation. If you have a big NFS server and you try and output you know, exports to all these different labs, very quickly you run into just the very practical issues of UID, GUID collisions, and that's just not easily dealt with. So this was an easy way to deal with that. It was also an easy way to deal with uh, virtualizing on the storage side, data separation. So if there happened to be a breach, it's contained, in theory, uh, to the VM front end that was breached, not to the whole system. And that's important from a policy perspective and a fine perfect perspective and all these other kinds of things. It also gives us some high availability features and load balancing and other kinds of things like that without a lot of intervention on our sysadmins. Uh, basically, you give us your money and we give you a, an export. That's it. It's not very exciting. It's not very sexy, but it's what people are asking for. And what you do beyond that is up to you. Um, we're going to start with NFS only, also not very exciting. Uh, we'll probably do SIFs and iSCSI a little bit down the road, uh, depending on the demand. We haven't had a huge demand or in a special case. Um, we've also looked at sort of web interfaces and other kinds of things. Uh, in as much as we can force, you know, kind of push it off to this layered model, I think that's what we're going to try and do. We'd like to be able to do one thing exceptionally well, very resilient and reliable, and not worry about a lot of other stuff. We don't have the staff, we don't have the money, we don't have, you know, like probably everybody here. So uh, this will solve 80% of people's problems, and many of them, 100% of them, we, we feel. 
Um, one thing many people have asked me is, you know, how are you going to handle security and all this stuff? Basically, the users never have access to the little VM export that they get, ever. Uh, everything will be done through a portal. Um, we have a no access policy by default, so they'll have to open up and decide what has access to this VM if they want. We'll allow them to use a campus routable network or a globally routable network on, you know, if they want to export to people outside UCLA. Um, encryption, uh, we're pushing that off on the users. And we had a, quite a few discussions with the campus security people. And uh, we, one of the reasons we're doing this is we don't want the keys. I don't want to have your private keys. Um, this way, we're hopefully going to have a fairly simple mechanism for them to do this. It is a little more complicated. Uh, but what, we're really, what we really decided is to try and have a mechanism where we can move the ball down the field. Because right now, people are not encrypting anything or very few of them are. And this is better than nothing. And if we can get this to work, we can move to something even more uh, uh, featureful. OK, so reliability over performance is our main issue, or our main goal, sorry. Uh, we don't expect the performance to be an issue, but we built and architected the system in a way where reliability is, is paramount. Reliability not only to protect the data, but reliability of the infrastructure, because we're trying to keep this simple and our, our staff overhead low. So if we have a problem, I, people don't have to drop their pants and fix it right then. We have a little bit of a window to be able to deal with the issue and the system should still run. That's really what we were after here. Uh, we want to stick with enterprise or HPC level hardware, not Fry's stuff. Um, that was a big goal. We will offer local mirroring of the data in two locations on campus. Uh, this is not a syncing, it'll be a, a, a live uh, hot mirror um, if you want. If you, some people don't want that. Um, and we haven't really explored this in any detail, but lots of people have asked for replication out of Southern. So OOSC means out of Southern California. So for Earth, right? I'm, I'm coining a new acronym, adding another acronym for you all to use. So I expect to see that in the future. Um, we would try, again, this would be kind of a layered thing. We would charge separately for this going forward. And you know, where we would do this and how and all that is, is completely not figured out yet. We, we know that it's something that people at UCLA want to do. Very quickly, I'm not going to go through all the details. You can read this yourself. I think the more interesting picture is uh, we're going to start with about two petabytes usable. And we expect to be able to grow that. Um, here's a fun little diagram. Um, we're using a lot of hardware that we have relationships with uh, companies already, which was allowed us to get the prices where we needed them to be, mainly HP and Mellanox. And uh, we're planning on using Nexan for the storage hardware. Uh, we've had good experience with it so far. Uh, NERSC has a huge 9 or 10 petabyte Nexan system, Apple uses Nexan, a lot, of, a lot of people are using it for sort of these big data cell kind of things. Um, the left and the right side, the only other interesting thing about this is these are two of our data centers that we have on campus, our math science, which is our main data center, and the one on the right is our, our HP pod, the container, you know, like the truck container you put on a ship, uh, which, which we like. Um, network. Uh, you know, someone asked me earlier whether we were going to be offering this to other UCs and whether the prices would be different. And my understanding is, is that once the service is approved, uh, we'll, we can offer it to any of the UCs. That is not our initial plan. I mean, we have plenty of people at UCLA who need this. But uh, my understanding is there will be no price difference or, or tax for non-UCLA users. Um, we're working on our 100 gig uh, uh, what would you call it, uh, roadmap at UCLA ourselves. Uh, this would obviously fit into that. We see 100 gig, or at least I do, uh, as an aggregation feature. So uh, that's where we're going with that. And I think that's it. The status is it's, it's being approved right now. We will offer in increments of one terabyte for one year. That's the minimum buy. 
we'll give discounts at different volume breaks and over number of years. So you can pre-buy the storage for out to five years. And you can see that right now our price range, this is for per terabyte per year, ranges from about less than 180 to below $115 a terabyte a year. So pretty cheap. Again, our goal was to make it competitive with what people were doing now. And I think we've come pretty close to that. And that's about it. So thank you for your time.